Hi, I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Foxholes, where I sit here in my chair of infinite knowledge and talk about... I don't talk about anything. I answer your questions about World War II. Mi Herusu, Mi Herusu 854 asks, what was the Bonaparte family up to during the war? Okay. Well, most of you know the Bonaparte family, um, for one man, mainly Napoleon, the first one, who, as we may one day find out, faced all too familiar circumstances against an all too familiar country, resulting in an all too familiar outcome. Anyhow, since his demise, the fortunes of the Bonaparte family, well, they had their ups and downs. The last big down being the end of Napoleon III's nearly 18-year reign as Emperor of France in 1870, and he was the last Bonaparte to rule. Still, the Second World War sees not one, but two members of the House of Bonaparte playing a part. The first one, strangely enough, is one that has been dead for over 100 years. Napoleon II, the son of Napoleon I, died at the age of 21 in 1832 and was laid to rest in Vienna. But then in 1940, following the armistice between Germany and the French under Philippe Pétain, Adolf Hitler agrees to return the young prince's remains to Paris. This isn't really anything more than a token sign of goodwill by Vichy French's puppet master, but Pétain is certainly happy about it. The second Bonaparte to play a role is Louis, Prince Napoleon, the claimant to the imperial throne of France as Napoleon VI. He was born in exile in Belgium, which means he technically cannot fight for France against Germany. However, he finds a loophole by taking a fake name and joining the French Foreign Legion. He's posted to North Africa before France falls in 1940. He is there until about 1941, after which he is demobilized by the Vichy French government. When back in Europe, he actually attempts to make his way to Britain via Spain to join the free French forces of Charles de Gaulle, which is kind of funny, considering de Gaulle is probably one of the most famous French Republicans, and Louis is unsurprisingly a little bit of a monarchist. Unfortunately for Louis, he is arrested crossing the Pyrenees and will spend the next few years in prison. Straight after being released in 1944, though, he actually joins the French resistance. Following the war, he will be decorated for his bravery and patriotism and will go on to become a successful businessman. He will also be finally allowed to legally return to France after the law of banishments is revoked in 1950. Taylan asks, how were the massive casualties of Barbarossa rece received in Germany? Were they even reported? I'm guessing that you mean the German casualties. Well, you're right. Casualties are indeed massive. Not as much as the Soviets, but still. July 1941 was the worst month of the war for Germany so far, with losses of 63,000 dead. The following months have seen a decrease in casualties, However, they still remain considerably higher than the campaigns in the West, the North, the South, and Poland. Were they reported? Okay, well, not in any significant way at first. The war is being fought thousands of kilometers away, so the German public is mostly unaware of what is going on unless they hear about it on the news. This allows the Nazi propaganda machine to, for the most part, control the narrative on the home front. Media outlets do not publish any definite figures or casualty reports. But news about the brutality of the fighting does slowly trickle home by word of mouth. It actually leads to quite a lot of anxiety among the population, something the SD Intelligence Service notices. Uh, a public opinion report in August 1941, compiled mainly from agents eavesdropping in cafes, shops, on street corners, states that it is often said that the campaign has not been proceeding as might have been assumed from reports at the start of the operation. Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels also notices this, writing in his diary that the party needs to stop promising so much and emphasize that this will be a difficult fight. Now. Germans do actually find out the official casualty figures in December 1941 when Hitler announces them to the Reichstag. He states that on the Eastern Front so far, there's been around 160,000 killed, about 500,000 wounded, and just over 30,000 missing in action. These figures are roughly accurate, 
Okay, a little lower than some more recent numbers, but still. But Hitler does admit that they are shocking. He is also careful to emphasize all the success Germany has had so far and the existential threat Bolshevism has historically played to Germany. And at the end of 1941, it seems most Germans are still confident that a victorious end to the war will come. For the time being, the news of high casualties breeds anxiety, as I said, much more than it does any sort of panic. Okay. Uh, Glam Scum asks, what was the Sino-German cooperation? I know China and Germany had some cooperation in reorganizing the Chinese army, but I'd like to know more specifics about it and what it included. Okay. The Sino-German military cooperation takes place from 1926 to 1941. Now, I have already covered the histories of these two countries in depth on our Between Two Wars series over on the Time Ghost channel. So I'm not gonna do it again here. But basically, Chiang Kai-shek wants to modernize the army of nationalist China in the face of increasing Japanese aggression, but does not trust Britain and France because of their historic imperial ambitions in the region. He trusts Germany more, and also apparently sees parallels between the two countries, seeing as how they've both been unified from a patchwork of traditionally competing states. In turn, this allows Germany to get around some of the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles. The treaty, well, the terms of the treaty, uh, bar Germany from producing military technology for itself. However, by agreeing to trade weapons with China, German industry can still develop and research such technology anyhow. The first significant contribution comes in 1929, after Chiang Kai-shek finally pacifies the Chinese warlords and unifies the Chinese Republic using military strategy German advisors have provided. Then in 1933, Hans von Secht, the man responsible for rebuilding the German army in the wake of the Great War, travels to China to try to repeat his success there. He sees to it that the military is, more, is organized in a more centralized and hierarchical fashion he outlines a program for China to industrialize its economy, to modernize its railway system. And this is a pretty good deal for both parties, actually. China can mass produce raw materials and sell them cheap to Germany. Von Sex transfers his post to Alexander von Falkenhausen in 1935. He continues this work. Von Falkenhausen will also recommend to Chiang Kai-shek that in case of a war with Japan, China is best suited to fighting out a war of attrition and using guerrilla tactics. And this is more or less what Chiang Kai-shek opts for when Japan invades in 1937. But this is also when Sino-German cooperation more or less stops, with Hitler choosing to favor Japan as his ally. However, the cooperation officially continues until 1941, when China joins the Allies and declares war on Germany. If you would like to know all about the history of East Asia in the interwar period, then have a look at the playlist we made containing all of our Between Two Wars episodes on the topic right here. I am able to sit here in the chair of infinite knowledge due to all of the amazing people who have joined us in the Time Ghost Army. I'm sure most of you are actually watching me say that. So thank you very much. And the rest of you, sign up at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. And if you would like me to answer your question, your burning question, your question that's better than anyone else's question, don't just write it in the comments because it might get lost. Post it at community.timeghost.tv. Community.timeghost.tv. See you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.